follow-up email. Um, if you do have some questions about how the program is running, do feel free to type those into the chat. I'll be moderating that tonight just to make sure that things stay on track. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start. And I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging that we're gathering here tonight uh, in acknowledgement that we are each attending remotely from the homelands of many different tribal nations. Here in Port Townsend, we're on the ancestral homelands of the Squalum, as well as the Chimicum, and additional federally recognized and unrecognized indigenous people. We pay respect to these people past and present and extend that respect to their descendants and to all indigenous people. If you at home happen to know the names of the tribe, whose homelands you're on, please take a second and go ahead and type those homelands and those, those people, pardon me, into the chat. Take a second and do that, those tribal names. And as you're typing those, I'll continue. Um, North Cascades Institute's mission, as you may know, is to inspire environmental stewardship through transformative experiences in nature. Um, and tonight, through transformative experiences right in the coziness of your own home. Okay, I'm going to introduce uh, our two poets for the evening. Saul Weisberg is the co-founder and former executive director of North Cascades Institute. He is a published poet and a seasoned naturalist, conservationist, and educator. His book, Headwaters, highlights the frank and surprising moment-to-moment -moment phenomenon of life in the Pacific Northwest and beyond. Tim's tenure as a writer and environmentalist in the region began in the 1970s. And his career includes essays, poetry, and natural history books. He won the Washington State Book Award and the National Outdoor Book Award. His most recent collection is Ascendance. Tim's poetry brings the reader into contact with the strength, vulnerability, and mystery of the natural world. And without further ado, I'm excited to hand things over to Saul and Tim right now. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, Evan. This is a lovely introduction. Appreciate it. There we go. All right. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Lee, for your hospitality. Thank you, North yes. Cascades Institute. It's really good to be here with you tonight. Um, Tim, it's fun. It's good to be with you tonight, so it's been a long time. Yeah. Um, we each share a, a, a reverence for the natural world and wild places, uh, mountains, rivers, coastlines, seas, uh, and our lives and work have been rooted in specific places here in the North Cascades and North Cascades, the Olympic, Salish Sea, the Outer Coast. Can you begin with a few poems that share your engagement with your, our home landscape? Sure, absolutely, thanks. Um, uh, we're going to be reading a few poems at a time, kind of back and forth, uh, exchanging some ideas on some themes and see where that goes. Uh, uh, feel free to comment any encouragement or condemnation <laughs> in the chats. I should also mention there's a very small select in-house audience here of, uh, of uh, family and, and, and a few close friends. So if you hear some tittering in the background, um, that's who that is. I wanted to start off with this poem. It's called Meditation Above Ozette. And it goes back to when I first came to the, uh, to the Northwest, to the Olympic Peninsula kind of trying to learn how to get settled here uh, and how to evoke this place in poetry. Um, I was planting trees out on the west end of the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, there was a, a little high ridge I'd walk up to after work and I'd look down on the Lake Ozette Basin, which at that time was largely uncut. And then the, uh, the uh, uh, stretch of, of national park land between the lake and the ocean, watch the sun go down early spring. Um, so there was there was no reason I shouldn't be inspired. I always kept a little uh, pocket notebook in my pocket to take notes. And so this is one of the first poems that came from that kind of practice of paying attention, uh, taking note of things, trying to capture the images and language. Often back then, and occasionally now, if I had something that sounded like it was coming into a poem, I'd read it out loud to the place see how the words sounded against the landscape. And the ending of this poem kind of reflects that. Meditation above Rosette. 
from the swamplands down in the draw. All the frogs you could ever hope to know are singing to each other. For miles, the low hills bow deeply to the lake. Who holds now the passing shadows of clouds as one holds a promise? East, the ridges still deep in snow are glowing some. And beyond them, the last ragged patterns of geese have disappeared, laughing their curious laugh against the night. I try this poem once for measure. No one but the wind. And uh, no one but but the win was the answer, you know, I got, which seemed appropriate. So uh, on I went. Um, this is a poem that comes from, um, uh, it's a little bit later, out on the Queets River, also on um, west side of the Olympic Peninsula. I was, I was uh, working trails and uh, practicing my poetry in the off hours, the Queets. We worked through dinner on a windfall spruce above Pelton Creek, a tree thick as we were tall. Wedging our cuts, edging PV and shim, wheel after slow turning wheel to near dark. Smoothed out the trail tread, packed our tools and started back seven miles down river to camp. Past Bob Creek, the last light was loosening itself from the grass, falling from the moss shoulders of maple and alder. A doe and her yearling browsed the far riverbank, and somewhere nearby, a flicker tapped randomly. The river carried with it its own light and coursed slowly through the late summer bottom. The tools lay in a pile where I dropped them at the trail side. My partner hadn't yet caught up. All I knew at the worn and frazzled end of that long day was the last light slipping from us, the chill air trothing down dark timbered slopes and the lucent voice of the river telling me it no longer Um, I think maybe um, one uh, little poem from the high country here in the Olympics and then one other short one uh, from the high country over in the Cascade Saul's uh, home landscape. Um, so this one's called The Wind in Lost Basin. Lost Basin, Upper uh, upper tributary of Lost River in the Northeastern Olympics. Late season, fall happening. There's a reference to um, the hunter in the closing stanza, uh, uh, reference to Orion, the, you know, the winter constellation, first peeking through. The wind in Lost Basin. All night long, the wind honed the slate and sandstone boulders, a late September wind just beginning to cut its teeth. It whittled at the talist ridge, moaned softly in the spindled trees, rattled the slender seed stalks to their knees. All the flapping tent fly night, like wind in the sails of a small lost boat, a ruffle in the marmot's thickening coat, sheen of ice in the shallows that one day soon won't melt away, the balance tipped to dark from day. No moon, Arcturus low, and the hunter slowly picking his way up the glacier. And um, This will, um, this poem will uh, shift things back over into Saul's country, the North Cascades, and I know he's got some uh, 
some North Cascades poems that he's going to be sharing as part of this little opening sequence. Um, I had the great good fortune in 2003 to work as a fire lookout up on uh, Sourdough Mountain Lookout in the North Cascades, immediately above North Cascades Institute's campus on Diablo Lake and in the heart of the Northern Mountains. This was um, when I first, uh, when I was first up there the first couple of weeks, uh, glass walls all around the starry night was so spectacular, it was hard to get to sleep. A late summer sun threads the needles of Macmillan spires and disappears in a reef of coral cloud. Winds roil the mountain trees, batter the shutter props. I light a candle with the coming dark, its reflection in the window glass flickers over mountains and shadowed valleys 17 miles north to Canada, not another light. The lookout is a dim star anchored to a rib of the planet, like a skiff to a shoal in a wheeling sea of stars. Night sky at full flood, wildly awake. So I know, Saul, you have uh, at least one lookout poem and a couple of other North Cascades poems you're going to share with us and maybe even some St. Lucie. Indeed. Thank you, Tim. Um, I came to the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, 46 years ago and began sinking into place. And um, the way I did that was through work. I started out working on the, on the ocean as a commercial salmon fisherman on a troller. Uh, fire lookout, and then began spending more time in the mountains as a backcountry climbing ranger at North Cascades National Park. So the first poem, uh, Fisherman's Song to the Shearwater. Shearwater is a oceanic bird, large, long wings, rarely seen, seen from land, but rarely seen from land, and long, I referenced this in the poem, tube noses, because they can drink seawater and excrete it, excrete it through their nostrils so they can Excrete the salt. Fisherman's Song to the Shearwater. From Destruction Island to the Columbia Bar, Astoria to Coos Bay, we follow the salmon. Green swells lift from astern, the boat shudders as the waves pass. To the east, the Olympics glisten through fog, the western horizon always receding. From the northwest, with the wind, Shearwaters glide between sea and sky. Brown scimitar, flash of pale wing linings, thin black bill and hooked tube nose. Knowing endless distance, sun, stars, new moon and storms. Stranger to land, shearwater. And from those days, I ended up studying shorebirds um, in the Salish Sea, primarily in Bellingham Bay. And this poem is uh, called Sandpiper Sweet. And for those of you who know birds, the first four lines are just names of birds. So if you can't picture them, just capture the language of these names. Sandpiper Sweet. Curlew, plover, sanderling. Snipe, Dunlin, Turnstone, Dowitcher, Knot, Wimbrel, Godwit, Yellowlegs, Ruff, Willet, Tatler, Phalarope, Stilt. Even their names are beautiful. All our songs crying out in the night, the smaller birds are silent. Along twisted coastlines, forgotten bays and islands, Coupled beach beaches, sand flats, mud, full moon and cloud haze. Restlessness shared of summer wings, long legs quick in half light, probing bill curved to follow what moves, yielding to flight, quick flash to morning sky. The wheeling flock trains itself south, tides beckon and fall away, horizons call with land's end, 
10,000 miles and three weeks away. And Tim, I appreciated your poem on sourdough. Look out. I was a look out on Three Corner Rock, which is down in a kind of a middle of a triangle between Mount St. Helens, um, Mount Adams, and Mount Hood, just above the Columbia Gorge. But this poem is um, uh, a walk, uh, early morning, long day walk up to the title of the poem, Desolation Lookout at the north end of Ross Lake. I wake in the night, an owl calls from the forest. At first light, a distant loon. Fresh snow on Nahokameen, icy morning hands, moon sets over the pickets. We leave cedars behind at the lake, raise clouds and sunlight up the mountain. Two red tails circle, circle upwards, screaming, west slope, lake wind. Friends out of sight, above me on the trail, so much beauty, every step new. The last few steps to look out, you can't go any higher. Empty bowl of sky, peaks hang from the clouds. The lake fills the valley. Spires of subalpine fur rise through the mist. We are surrounded by stories. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right, that is a fun trip. And then I began uh, working in the mountains as a, as a ranger. And um, I mean, that job changed my life in so many ways. Walking into mountains, walking into mountains in the rain, deeper and deeper, everything is green. Climbing into a clear light, absence of sound and birds on the crest of the ridge one rock melted free of snow trail work long thin song of winter wren spills through the forest the waterfalls of distant peaks move closer all day working on trails, shoveling snow above Timberline. In the evening, over Mount Buckner, the rose of a different star dims and dies. And then we started this thing, crazy thing called North Cascades Institute. <laughs> and a few years in, uh, a friend of mine, John Miles, and I did a reconnaissance for what became uh, Youth Leadership Adventures, the program of taking high school kids out to do leadership work and environmental history and all kinds of really powerful things. And uh, this was on that, uh, the reconnaissance of that, uh, for that program. September Storm, Ross Lake for John Miles. The green canoe waits in the rain. Walking in clouds, no one hears our footsteps. Hanging on the end of the fir bough, raindrop eye of the nuthatch. Between two maple branches, the spider's web catches rain. Too lazy to walk to the lake, we place a kettle under the dripping tarp. Waiting for tea to steep, I turn the page. The forest grows dark, light rests on the lake. White caps move slowly, clouds of memory, clouds of memories along the shore. Wow. All right. Yes. Yeah. Pretty See, kettle under the kettle under the dripping tarp is a quintessential Northwest image. It is. It is. So Tim, um, in addition to our times in the mountains, some of which were in solitude, which mm -hmm. were pretty powerful times, and, okay. um, and others uh, with others. We have both been really deeply engaged with our communities and the human relationships that are so important uh, within that context of the national world. Uh, when I was young, solitude really was the most important part to me. Yeah. And now it's spending time with friends. Um, um, would you share some poems that celebrate 
those times, but in the context yeah. of company, company of friends and companions. Yeah, yeah, uh, 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 community in the larger context of the natural world has always kind of, I think that's a theme in both of our, uh, both of our uh, poems over the years. So um, this one will start off uh, this little set with a uh, little river love poem. It's a poem for uh, my wife, Mary. When we were first together, we lived mm, 10 years on a little Pulsine River, not far from, from Pulsine, Northeast Olympics. Um, on an old homestead there, you know, the last place at the end of the road. Kind of a nice cozy time. Uh, the early summer light steps bird-like down the east slope of Green Mountain and stirs low mists along the river into flight. Back inside, you lie still asleep in your summer skin, a blue sheet thrown back like a dress, your dark, hair spilled rain over your shoulders. Having so much and nothing at all to say, I slip cold arms around you. You turn sleepily and a deep green river drifts away in your waking eyes. From a wooden skiff tied to a salmonberry bush, you step ashore holding in your arms everything I ever let slip away. Um. <laughs> yes, thank you, thanks. Um, yeah, that was a very kind of a, a just, a, it seems almost an idyllic time those years uh, uh, back then in a leaky old, drafty old farmhouse with the wood stove going 24 hours a day. Um, this one is um, a couple of poems here from um, when um, our daughter Caitlin was growing up. Uh, so once again, kind of family relationship will be maybe, yeah, I think all these will be kind of family poems. This is um, Wild Animals. Uh, at a certain point when Caitlin was still a pretty little kid, her one of her tasks, chores, became taking the compost out, you know? And I guess it was after dinner and the time had changed, maybe in the fall, it got dark. So, wild animals. Dinner over, just past dark, and my daughter refuses to carry out the compost. There's wild animals out there. That's nonsense, I say, grabbing the pail and purposely leaving the flashlight behind. Past the porch light, total darkness. Then, just beside me, a deer startles and jumps noisily into the bush. A dozen steps later, heart still hammering, I lean to tip the pail, and a low, toothy snarl rises from darkness a foot away. I'm halfway back to the house, compost scattered, before I realize, raccoon. <laughs> Christ, as the kitchen door slams behind me. There's wild animals out there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there still are, as a matter of fact. Got a little bit better lighting now. <laughs> um, and this one is um, another, another one from around that time uh, called Some Ducks. And uh, uh, this poem type kind of takes place in a pause, a kind of a a long pause between two parts of a sentence. Now, if we're real quiet, I whisper to Caitlin. And with the next step, a thunder of wings fills the sky. Cloudburst of feathers and spray as dozens of mallards explode from a small pond. Blue white shimmer of wing bars and vapor billows across the winter sky. Caitlin stands frozen as a second, then third wave erupts before us, astonished that our quiet approach could trigger such spectacular alarm. The royal surface splashes up in waves over the shore ice. The din of wing beats fades, and the sky is suddenly monumental in its emptiness. Our eyes meet with my unfinished thought. 
we might see some ducks. <laughs> um, so a couple of those from uh, from uh, way back, and then um, this is one. Um, so yeah, yes. This is one from uh, my father. It's um, it's my father speaking. I did some taped interviews uh, with him uh, when he was uh, much older. Uh, my, I, I always thought of my father as a as an old guy, and 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 he always was. He was born in 1901, so even when I was a kid, he was an old guy. Um, uh, but uh, so, um, and he was a good storyteller. So this is one of them. My father speaking. And it, it refers to the American chestnut, which I think everybody knows um, was wiped out by, a, by a, a, an Asian blight in the early 1900s. So my father speaking, in those years, the aughts and early teens, it was woods from Mount Pleasant Street clear to West Peak. Eight of us kids then, Fran wasn't born yet. And I'll be honest, we were often hungry. We'd find food where we could. In fall, when the chestnuts were ripe, we'd comb McCarty's woods for them. We smaller kids would get a boost up to the lower limbs, but the big boys would find stout logs and give those trees a whack. Old brother, with those chestnuts come showering down, would fill gunny sacks, all we could carry, and haul them back to Ma, who'd roast them in the cook stove. The house would fill with their flavor, the nicest, sweetest nuts we ever ate. In 1917, the blight took them all. They never came back. When you were kids, I'd bring home bags of European chestnuts, remember? But they were nothing, nothing compared to those wild nuts from the woods. To tell the truth, I don't know what we'd have done without them. So a little, uh, a little insight into uh, kind of uh, crafting, you know, uh, uh, surviving uh, uh, native landscape, natural landscape, back in a pretty heavily developed part of the world. Uh, let's see. So um, kind of thinking, Saul, that uh, we're... Um, Yeah, okay. So we're gonna pass this over to you now. You have, I think, one poem for your father. Yeah. And uh, and a couple of others for friends and family, so. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, I am, uh, ever since I first heard you read that little River Love poem for Mary, that poem has blown me away. Oh. That last line about everything I ever let slip away, it's, it's amazing. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. That's um, the truth. Yeah. <laughs> well, that makes a better poem. Yeah. Yeah. It does. <laughs> it does. yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, so Shelly and I have been together for 40 years this year, we realized. Ooh, all and, right. Um, so anyway, this poem was from oh, a um, a wonderful fall evening up at Pelton, Pelton Basin below Cascade Pass uh, with Shelley. It's called Pelton Basin. Moonlight touches the ridge crest, fresh snow dusts the peaks, cold September stars paint the shadows of the night. In the midst of all this bright beauty, your smiling face, dancing eyes, Curves of breast and belly, tasting the darkness, tasting the mountains. Gentle woman, to wake again nestled in your arms would be all I ask. To kiss the hollow of your neck, a blessing. And that was from, you know, 40 years ago. This one was more recent. Solstice, in a meadow at the edge of Timberline, I wake to the spring song of the chickadee and remember you teaching me the names of flowers before we married. So I have a, 
a bunch of poems about my dad. Um, and I'll, I'll, read, I'll add one here and read, and read two. Um, he's been gone for 15 years. And there was a time when I thought of him every day. And then there, now there are many days when I don't think of him, but this, this last period of time, um, these last year and a half, I've been thinking of him a lot more often. Remembering stories we were told for Weisberg. When you died, we lost all your stories. Why did I believe they would last forever? Your hands are still holding all those memories that we let slip through our fingers. An hour before sunrise, we wait for that quiet space to fill with birdsong and the sound of falling water. The candle flickers each time someone enters the room. Goldfinches. One of my father's gifts was the joy that would light his face when he saw something beautiful. Goldfinches in the spring, morning waves on a lake, a sunset glimpse through the trees. He smiled with his lips pulled back as if the bright flash of beauty had seared him with its sudden heat. Then he would turn his head to make sure that we had seen it too. It's interesting as I was looking for poems for this evening that I, I found myself going back over and over again to poems about people who are no longer here. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's the season um, or the times we're living in, but, yeah. um, but this is a special one. Listening to silence for Rotha Miles. Mm -hmm. On the last day of November, light leaves the earth too soon. The forest walks into winter, winged seeds cling to the maples. Golden eye leave ripple trails as they rise from the lake, wing whistle overhead. At least a dozen species of lichen and moss crowd the twisted branches of the fallen alder, 100 shades of gray and green. Bird calls. Kinglets, bush tits, chickadees, an eagle on the far shore. Magic light tonight, clouds glow under suffused sun. Lake mist rises like tendrils of lost hair. The lake is absolutely still listening to silence. And I was struck as we were talking about picking poems that were about people, that they're all, it's not all the wild world sometimes. Uh, and it's not all people that we've known for a long time. Sometimes they are just moment, momentary moments of connection. And this last one I'll read in this section is called Ta Taxi Man. Running for a taxi at the Austin airport, the taxi man with gray ponytail and missing incisor motions me into the front seat of an old Crown Victoria, the back scattered with paper and books. He watches as I turn to look at a flock of birds under the shrubs as he turns on at the edge of the freeway. A few minutes later, he pulls off the road, passes a pair of battered binoculars to me and points to a cell tower where a great colony of monk parakeets have covered the metal structure with loose stick nets, nests. We sit for a long moment watching birds as angry traffic zooms past. He tells me of a 
sea of blue-green wings moving north these past five years, then turns on the radio and violins fill the cab. The rest of the way into Austin, we talk about those beautiful wings and music from the other side of the world. We don't always know what we think we know until someone shows us and we listen. Ah, lovely. Yeah, fine phone. Um, yeah, I'll be looking for that guy next time I fly into Austin. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned the uh, kind of the dark of the year and, and, and thinking about um, uh, friends, acquaintances, family that are gone. And we are, it's December today, I guess, huh? And we're approaching, you know, that dark time of year. Certainly, it's a, it's a dark time in our history. Just a, a, a dark time, I think, worldwide right now. A lot of things that are going on. Um, we're also approaching the solstice and the return of the light. So um, how do you, uh, where do you go in your poem, Saul? Where do you go to um, really to, uh, yeah, to find, uh, to find the light, to find the, uh, the glimmer through the darkness, to, to, to get you through, you know, some pretty dark times? Wow. Well, sometimes I think I know the answer to that, and sometimes I don't. Um, I think uh, Bob Pyle once told me that a naturalist business is paying attention. And I think you once told me that a poet's business is paying attention. <laughs> so I guess if I learned anything, it's that I should pay attention. And I'm not sure if that's, I guess it is partly about giving hope but I think being in the moment is what makes, it puts everything, it puts me in the, when I'm in the moment, everything else goes far away. Mm -hmm. The memories of the past and the hopes and fears of the future. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's not always a happy place in the moment, but it is, it's a, it's a good place. It's a settled, settled place. Mm -hmm. And so I picked a few poems where I was kind of thinking, that I was in the moment, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll make this little note here. Oh, I see, yeah. Uh, this first one is called Ascending Heather Pass. It's North Cascades. Ascending Heather Pass. Clouds in the valley, blue on the summit, sun and shadows. Last night's rain at the center of each leaf, a single pool of light. Three miles and still climbing, I come upon an old woman hiking with backpack and crutches. Unsure of how to pass on the narrow trail, I walk slowly 50 feet behind. When she stops, bends over, I kick stones. She looks up smiles and exclaims, the violets are so blue. Her eyes sparkling are also blue. Uh, yeah. And I guess I should mention that this was just at dusk and I was racing up the trail to meet some friends who'd gone up earlier in the day, trying to get up there before dark mm -hmm. and didn't want to pass her on the narrow trail. But when she stopped, we talked, asked her if she needed any help. She said, no, I, Used to backpack all over, and now I've got these damn things, the crutches, wow. but I'm fine. Go ahead. So yeah. I did and um, met my friends, and, then I, and they had young kids. And the next day, we didn't get started probably till 11, hiking up farther up. And after we'd gone a little while, we could see on a snowfield against the sky her crossing the snowfield with her crutches and her backpack. Wow. And I was just like, Okay. Yes. I'm not going to complain yes. anymore. Let's see. Okay, yeah. So this is also sort of that 
paying attention to the moment and then everything else sort of falls away. End of summer. The cries of migrating swans stitch the clouds together, white on white. Rain yesterday, sun this afternoon, cold trees shedding leaves. In the brown reeds, a red-winged blackbird remembers his summer song. Each, so each stroke of my paddle brings me closer to those I love. And this is this, the description this, in this poem, Home Ground, is really about a, a thing, a map. But the poem is really about the moment when I saw that and just realized what it meant and what it was. Home Ground. It's good to have a lake close to home, also rivers, mountains too, familiar terrain and the comfort of well traveled trails. In my pocket, on the torn corner of a map, directions to a place called home. I think, let me throw this other quick one in here. Good, good. 65. Sometimes when I think of how crazy the world is, like somebody, somebody or I remember this thing called geologic time, deep time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is called centuries. Mountains wait, they gather rain. Salmon and cedar move north. After a long time, the light changes and something new comes along. No one knows. What happens next? I used to, um, when people used, when, people, when I was asked for a long time, when people asked, um, what gives you hope? I, and many people would say, children give us hope. And I think I've, and, I, and then recently for the last number of years, I've stopped saying that. Because when I think of children, I think of, this world, we are leaving them. And that's not hopeful. Mm -hmm. And so what gives me hope now are all the people out there, young people, but mostly adults, who are working really hard to save and change this world, climate change, food justice, racism, all of the things that we need to be working on so hard without knowledge that we will be able to succeed. Yeah. And we have to succeed for those children. So this poem is very recent and it comes back to the beginning here because it does give me hope mm -hmm. because my first grandchild was born a month ago That's right. and I had no idea you could love someone so completely, so quickly. <laughs> People said, oh, being a grandparent will be great. But, and I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. But um, it was something completely crazy. So my child, Teal, asked me to write a poem for a birth uh, naming ceremony for their child, Sova. Sova is Yiddish for little owl. This poem is called Little Owl. In the spring, before we knew your name, we heard the first notes of the dawn chorus and dreamed of you. Before you were born, we heard your heart beating softly, quickly, like the wings of a small bird deep in the forest. Autumn wings bring rain, Salmon climbs the creek, coming home. In the calm between storms, the night is alive with the cries of migrating geese. Sova, little owl, 
born near the confluence of two rivers in the shadow of a mountain. We've been waiting a long time to meet you. May you grow wild, healthy, and free. May, be, may you be curious, strong, and kind. May you know courage and compassion, laughter and love. Learn the names of the watersheds of home, the languages of birds, trees, and rock, the stories of all who came before, those who are still here, and those who are yet to come. Welcome, Sovala, to our beloved and troubled world. Ah, beautiful, man. That's a really, really fine poem, Saul. Yeah, yeah. about that big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Tim, I think we need a couple more poems from you to yeah. begin to wrap this evening up, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Uh, Sounds good. I know you've got a couple of timely poems you'd like to share with us. Okay. Um, yeah, there's two two here. Uh, um, yeah, it has it's it, yeah it has been a yeah kind of a rough year in a, a, a lot of ways, and and uh, uh, one of those ways has been uh, losing some pretty dear old friends, people uh, who have been real insp inspirations to me. Um, but I thought um, coming back around to to hope, one of the one of the places that's that kind of just is giving me a lot of a lot of hope through through some pretty through some pretty troubling times is the Elwha River. The Elwha having been restored with the uh, removal of two dams um, and the return of salmon. We're always out there. We're out there all year round. Uh, checking things out, and uh, and so this is a poem. This comes from last um, a year ago, summer, uh, late summer, maybe September. Uh, it's called "Smoke Salmon Snowmelt Prayer for a Warming World." And I just mentioned um, uh, this is uh, Mary and I were out on this walk with my uh, old and dear friend and and uh, an inspiration to me in many ways, Jerry Gorslein, who uh, and his wife Beth. Jerry passed away just uh, this past spring. A pall of smoke from western fires shrouds familiar peaks and ridges, but a cool slipstream along the river freshens the air. And the late summer flow of the Elwha glimmers clear through dark trees. There, like shadows over blue-gray river-bottom stones, a pair of Chinook salmon holds against the current. The female rolls on her side at times and kicks stones loosely over the nest. The larger male swims slowly beside her, both are nearing their ends. Secure in river-washed cobble, hundreds to thousands of fertilized eggs breathe the clear, cold, oxygenated flow. Part of me comes here to breathe as well. Forests, brushlands, and towns burn to the south. This year of record fires, hurricanes rack the gulf, Floodwaters churn over farmlands and a pandemic flares again and again like an angry curse. Here, a century of harm turned back. Dams came down, a watershed choked with concrete and steel breathes again. Salmon returned to a people and a river and with them a glimpse of a different way to be a promise and a taste clear and startling as snow melt. Even as smoke thickens and obscures for now, all but the nearest hills. And um, I said that was kind of an upbeat. I thought, you know, maybe not so much. <laughs> Powerful. <laughs> oh, thank you, Sam. Or, 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 or. Uh, this is um, this is called Ho River Trail, and and uh, um, um, my dear old friend and, and and fellow poet Mike O'Connor died last winter, 
uh, beginning of this year. Um, Mike was um, um, Olympic Peninsula uh, native. He grew up here. And um, when I showed up going on 50 years ago, now Mike kind of uh, took me under his wing, uh, kind of broke me into some work, some jobs I could do to, you know, kind of be able to, you know, get my feet under me here. And of course, was a, a, a great uh, uh, supporter and inspiration of, 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 of my poetry. And we, you know, we kind of just sort of grew as poets together, I think, for a lot of years. Um, so, uh, yeah, one of the, one of the, Jobs. I used to kid him. You know, he he, he told me a hundred ways to go broke in the woods. But uh, one of the one of the jobs uh, that he <laughs> got me into was working working on trails. So this is a uh, whole river trail. It's dedicated to Mike. Rain is relentless, and muddy stretches have swallowed the trail. We're soaked through, worn out, down to rice and Lipton soup. Even your stalwart donkey. Balaam seems dispirited. Yet over tea and a smoky morning fire, you coax me on. One last push to Elf Lake and the meadows and we'll have the whole, whole trail open. Then we can drag our tired asses and single jackass the 16 miles out to the truck. Think of the stories you'll get from this McNulty, epics of misery, despair, maybe even survival. Your sidelong grin as you load a pinch of Copenhagen is infectious. I shrug and rise, help fit the pack saddle and pad on the donk, saw, gas, Pulaski, shovel. So much, I still so much I had to learn. But new in my bones, even then, we were in this together. No way could I bail. It's nearly 50 years later, Mike, and once more I watch as you head off into the mist ahead of me. When I find you again, it will be in the mountains. John Dao wrote in ninth century China, and you brought back to us in English. This morning, I lose you once more to farewell. Like Ja, you signed on early to a life of poetry and friendship. That was enough. But the rains have returned with a vengeance this winter. The trail below Elk Lake slid out and forever closed to stock. Only you and Balaam now, on toward the mountain, vanished in blowing clouds. When I find you again, old friend. So that, uh, I guess, wraps up our uh, formal poetry reading part of the evening. And um, uh, we're thinking that maybe there was a few comments or, or questions that, that, that came in that might, might spark some further conversation between, uh, between Saul and me. And, uh, and so, Evan, you're uh, kind of monitoring that. And I guess, you know, anyone here that has any that has any questions or comments? Yeah, I can start by relaying some comments that came in through the chat throughout the reading. Be great. Yeah. Well, there was a, a there was a thank you from Holly Hughes. Uh, she wanted uh, to recognize the placement there on the shelf behind you. <laughs> we'll bring that up. And Michael Daly as well. Yes. This wasn't, uh, wasn't an accident. I think I'll just acknowledge this right now. Yeah. Uh, Holly Hughes has edited a wonderful uh, edition of the Madrona Project, volume two, number one. Uh, Keep a green bow voiced from the heart of Cascadia. And this is a wonderful collection of poems um, focused a little bit on this last couple of years of pandemic time and getting by, but reaching out much beyond that as well. Um, all women poets uh, from Cascadia or about Cascadia and many, many, many indigenous voices. And this is a utter gem. 
Mm -hmm. It is. Show us the front. Oh. <laughs> from Empty Bowl. Oh, yes, from Empty Bowl Press. <laughs> yeah, Empty Bowl Press website, you can find it. Yes. Or your local independent bookseller. Yes, the Madrona Project, Volume Two, Number One. Keep keep a green bow. Voices from the heart of Cascadia. Put it right. We'll put it right back here. Yeah, good. Behind the Buddha. Uh, the next comment comes from some strange person named Libby Mills. <laughs> Libby. 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 Says each time hearing these poems, a new fire burns down to embers. Thanks, friends. Oh, she would write a poem as an acknowledgement yeah, yeah. of the poetry. Right. And, uh, and Libby, you were around for some of these poems, so thank you. <laughs> and then I think, um, Tim, when you were reading Wild Animals, I think this comment came in um, from Gina Hippus. Oh, Gina Hippus. Hippus? Yes. Gina Hippus. Um, all caps, I love this poem. <laughs> Thanks, Jenna. <laughs> it's become a favorite of mine, too. <laughs> Your daughter was right. <laughs> yeah, she was. About four exclamation she points. She reminded me of that a few times since. Um, and Michael Lee, presumably who maybe you know, um, says, hello, Tim and Saul. I had to join tonight to indulge my yearning to see you, hear you, and have your poems transport me back to my days on Lake Crescent and Olympic Park Institute. Oh, Mike now, Lee, yeah. wow. Hey, Mike, long time. Mike. My best to you, he says. And nice. we hope you're eating some of your delicious baked concoctions right now with your friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, Holly wanted to say how beautiful the poem was for your grandchild. So. Yeah, yeah, it really was. Um, Thank you. Chuck Easton wanted to share, um, Chuck appreciates your thought about hope, Saul, and loved your poem for your new grandchild. That was from Autumn. Austin. Um, again, another compliment for that poem um, from Sarah McCoy. It says, beautiful poem for Silva, Saul. You must have hope in the children. Being a grandparent is transformational. Uh, and then a bit of a prompt here, more so than a question, um, from one Christian Martin. <laughs> goes like this. It's great to be here with you two and all the others at this virtual poem sharing. Saul, congratulations on your well-deserved retirement this year from the Institute. I know that Tim was a poetry teacher for NCI in the way back early days. I was lucky to attend NCI retreats with Tim along with Bob Pyle, Annie Zwinger, and before there was an environmental learning center. Can you two share about how you first connected, how Tim helped infuse humanities and poetics into the Institute's approach to conservation and education? I remember the first time we met do you talk? I do. Okay. I do. Um, I didn't know any real poets back in 1970. No, 19. That's mm, early 80s. Right now, maybe 79, 78. Mm -hmm. um, but there was this famous. Northwest poet reading at Fast Eddie's in Bellingham. Oh my gosh, that was a long time ago. That was yeah, a long time ago. That yeah. was from Pawtrax, I think it was. It, uh, Tracks had just come out. So yeah. what year was that? 78. 78. Yeah. And we talked after that and oh, we just started right. talking. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure what. We, I think we both had a little bit to drink, maybe. Might have been. Fast Eddie's was a local dive. <laughs> Bellingham. Long yeah. gone, yes. Yeah, yeah. But I'd be really, before I say anything, I'd be really interested in your take on the role of poetry, literature, the writing process in natural history and conservation work, which can often be focused more on science and politics. Well, yes, <laughs> but... I wanted to acknowledge um, that when I first became aware of the work that that, that you and your and your partners were starting to do at North Cascades Institute, I was I was blown away that um, poetry and field drawing, uh, um, uh, various you know uh, 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 journaling, various art forms were were part of the of a natural history school in a national park, and uh, and some of these some some of the uh, writers and heroes who I admired immensely. Gary Snyder, Philip Whalen, 
Jack Kerouac were being honored as part of the heritage of this place of the North Cascades, where they worked as fire lookouts and um, uh, a place I was uh, becoming to know and and love. And I thought, so oh, this guy Saul is he's he's really leaps and bounds ahead of anything that you know that that I know was happening in terms of uh, you know the uh, fledgling Olympic Park Institute that was happening here. So so I was uh, uh, thrilled to you know to be. Uh, uh, invited to start um, uh, teaching and, 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 and taking part in, in some of those uh, in, in, in some of the early early workshops and, and, and those for, for many years, the uh, seminars, adult seminars. Um, uh, yeah, the, the the role of poetry I, I find in in terms of conservation work, um, which is of course in, in, informed by natural history, informed deeply by by science, but. Um, um, sometimes there, there just needs to be a more immediate connection with the heart and soul of what are happening to our wild lands, what, what are happening to our rivers, um, our species, um, our species, um, many, many species, not human species. And that poetry for me was a way to um, kind of capture my enthusiasm, my uh, 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 concern, my outrage, my uh, uh, my ecstasy of, uh, uh, in terms of engaging with, with the natural world, and and earlier on, my readings were peppered a little bit more with uh, <laughs> with a, a radical conservation message. And I may, maybe I'm maybe I'm backing off a little bit now, but uh, uh, certainly a lot of the poems uh, poems in my first book had uh, um, uh, had that, and 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 I saw it as just a maybe not so much a strategy as just a natural expression of what I was dealing with in my life, in my, in my work, in my volunteer work, and, and trying to make that come uh, alive in language in a way that would connect with, uh, you know, with larger audiences who maybe don't have the, the, um, the luxury and the privilege to, 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 to live closely to natural systems, to experience them on a daily basis. So I don't know if that's what you know you were. Yeah. Well, I think I think. I mean, I I was a science. I was trained as a field biologist. Um, I was had some training as a poet, but I think we fell in love with the place. And when you're telling the stories of place, science is one of the stories of place. Mm -hmm. Art and music and writing is one of the stories of place. And like you said, those art and I mean, the humanities, art, music, poetry that hits you right here. For most people, science hits you here. And for, I think for great scientists, it's both. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people are turned off by science. I mean, some people can look at a bird list or phonology or other things, and, and that tells you so much about a place. But for some people, that's a list of, that's data. And they don't, they don't feel it the same way. And so I think from us, we wanted to tell, share the stories of, of the North Cascades in order for people to fall in love with it and protect it mm -hmm. and, and protect and, and support the places where it was protected, like a national park and national forests and all the other protected, you know, bits and pieces in, in this large ecosystem. So it, to us, it never, it always seemed like an obvious thing to do. It wasn't until people kept started saying, it's, it's just wonderful and weird that you're adding these other pieces into us. Like, well, how could you not do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, what was your first mission statement? Well, <laughs> <laughs> our first mission statement, if I rewind back before I knew what a mission statement was, <laughs> uh, which was certainly early days, but I, our first mission statement was to save the world. Right. And we wanted to start at home. Yeah. Um, and then, no, our first mission statement was to change the world. That's what I was saying in the beginning. And then I was giving it, I was, we had some students on a class up in the mountains somewhere and an older woman, she probably was 40 then, I don't know, older, I thought at that point in my life. Um, and I didn't find out till later that she had written one of the first field guides to the Olympics and Cascade wildflowers. But she said, she said, Saul wants to change the world. I only want to save a part of it, this part of it. And I thought, She's got it right. Change can go in many different directions and the world yeah. is a larger piece. And so from that mission statement to this mission of 
inspiring, inspiring environmental stewardship through transformative learning experiences. Those experiences have to be physical, spiritual, mental, artistic, everything together with mm -hmm. as little separation as possible. Mm -hmm. That's difficult, but if you're gonna have a, if you got a mission, you ought to go big. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Good. You got any questions out there in the world? We have a very straightforward question. What is the name of Saul's book? Oh, oh I can one. do that. Headwaters, Poems and Field Notes. Okay. Uh, Pleasure Book Pleasure Studio. Book Studio. Show them the book. <laughs> <laughs> you can get it from North Cascades Institute <laughs> and your local independent bookstore. <laughs> I guess the North Cascades is a local independent bookstore. <laughs> Uh, great. There is a beautiful thank you both from Kirk's iPad. Um, wonderful tribute to O'Connor from Jim Pearson. Oh, here's one. Thank you, brothers, from Tom and Eddie in the Mogollon Highlands of Arizona. Eddie, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, Eddie. Yeah. yeah. Right back at you <laughs> from a from a somewhat clear day in the peninsula. Yeah. Um, what a blessing to spend the first evening of December with the words of Tim and Saul from Gary Bullock. Oh, fine, nice, wonderful poet. Mm. Fetching us Valley poet. Great guy. Um, Great birder. Mm. Thank you, Saul. This is Holly Hughes in reference to the Madrona Project. Linda Okazaki did the beautiful cover painting, a wonderful Port Townsend artist. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's a question from Carolyn Gastelum. What are the places you return to or hope to return to in the wild landscapes that have inspired your poetry? You first. Uh, places I hope to get back to um, uh, the, uh, the, the Alaska Range, which in, in, it, it inspired a little uh, collection of poetry when I uh, spent some time, extended time there climbing uh, back in the old days. Um, and of course, uh, the desert country of the Southwest. I just don't get there enough anymore. Uh, the Rockies we do see on occasion. And um, I pray that I will someday be able to uh, kick my boots into Queets Basin again on the Southern Bailey Range of the Olympics. We'll just see uh, what the knees have to say about mm. that. <laughs> coming Thanks, Tim. Wow. Um, everything. Um, I mean, this this year, this summer was the first time I've ever spent any significant time in Southeast Alaska. And that gave me a sense of possibility that I, I think Shelly and I are definitely planning on revisiting. Um, I hiked the, the Olympic Coast. Tom Fleischer and I hiked the Olympic Coast. The Olympic Coast and the Dungeness and, and Royal Basin and, and uh, all of those areas last in 1984. Mm -hmm. And I would love to get back into some of yeah. those places. Some would do easier yeah. than others. Um, and I find myself, it's interesting, I find myself doing very little climbing these days, which was my driving force back in the 70s and 80s, 70s and 80s for sure. I think that's how I define myself in so many ways. And now I would say it's more paddling. So I think I'm gradually starting to learn more and more of the rivers and the creeks and going back to them over and over again is a whole nother way to travel and a little easier on the knees uh, unless you're carrying the canoe on your back. Uh, but I just think that there's, and one of my favorite things to do is, is go to some place where either from a base camp near a vehicle or a base camp a few miles in to just start doing those long day trips out and back because I can do that with, with books and with other gear. And so it's not so much about cranking out the miles unless I'm on the water. It's more about being able to stop and look and for Shelly to sit down with uh, Hitchcock and, and key out plants while I do a big loop on the ridges and get back to come in, get back together. So um, there's just there's just so much. Um, so I, I, it's hard to say any particular place. I, I don't have, I have many favorite places. And like someone told me recently, my favorite place, it's the next place I'm going. 
And sometimes you know what it is, and sometimes you don't. But Carolyn, it's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for speaking to that. Um, this is uh, for Tim from Autumn Scott. Hmm. Autumn appreciates hearing your memories of Jerry Gorsline and Michael Connor. Uh, yeah. Uh, she says, I realized the new poem about hiking along the Elwha and always love hearing the poem from Mike from the old days. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Autumn. Yeah, Autumn was there when we uh, sent Mike's ashes off down the Elwha. <laughs> and Autumn wrote a beautiful uh, remembrance of Jerry Gorsline as well. Early mentor for both of us. Um, Hope is hearing poetry read aloud by soulful elders wearing matching vests, glasses, and beards. <laughs> says, oh, it's guilty as charged. <laughs> says uh, Dave Schreffler. Oh. <laughs> and later on, Dave Schreffler said, just to be clear, I use the term elders with profound respect. Oh, oh thank you, Dave. Um, there's a little more banter. Um, I'll skip through some of that. Um, on, the, <laughs> on the subject of hope, it would certainly help me in that regard to listen to, to read your poems every night. Thanks so much from Bill Affalter. Oh, Bill, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bill. Affalter. Yeah. Um, okay, well, just one more little bit, uh, bit of banter here. Dave, it's hard to recognize Tim. He's so shorn, says Jim Pearson. <laughs> Um, and Christian Martin wanted to chime in with a question, says, rest in power, Robert Bly, who passed away last week. That's right, yeah. Were either of you influenced or informed by Bly's work in poetry and narrative or translation? Uh, yeah, very much so. Uh, Bly's, um, especially Bly's earlier books, uh, Silence in the Snowy Fields, um, when, you know, when he was, um, uh, um, a, a much more rural poet writing very close, deliberate poems of, of landscape and, and, and uh, uh, just a, a very deep insight. And um, I followed, uh, followed his work pretty closely back then in the, the journals that he published. I was, a little, I was a little young for the 50s, but um, each year he'd rename his poetry journal the 70s, the 80s, and uh, publishing many, many um, uh, really, really wonderful uh, poets that were an inspiration to me. And also uh, Robert Bly, um, one of the uh, really first um, American poets to really popularize poetry and translation of, uh, from Latin America, Pablo Neruda, uh, especially and many other, many other uh, poets um, who, who are now just considered part of the canon. But back in the 70s, uh, they weren't showing up very many, many places besides Bly's uh, uh, Bly's uh, journals and uh, some of them that he translated himself. So, yeah, we owe him a great debt. Yeah, I loved the same thing. I lo loved his poetry. And then he came uh, to Antioch College, where I was a student in oh, 1973, wow. in a room about this size with about 10 students showed up. Wow. And he scared the crap out of us. <laughs> he, showed, <laughs> he, he wasn't. He was sitting in the back of the room. We all know who he was, but he was sitting and he was all kind of punched over and, and he was wearing all kind of a robe. Yeah. And it was like, okay, we thought maybe he's a little frail or something. And then he was introduced and it was kind of a little bit of an academic introduction. Mm -hmm. And then he put on a mask and he jumped up and he, and he started walking around the room and he'd come up to you and he'd like, <laughs> and he'd just start reciting and yeah. kind of, and so it was the first real performance art I'd ever experienced. And my mind was just going crazy. But he did read a lot of poems from Latin America. Yeah. That he, I don't know if they, he, they were in the journals yet, but he was working on them. Mm -hmm. He would talk about some of the translation, and they were beautiful. And I think they opened up everyone's eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Christian, for, for bringing up Reverend Yeah. So. Thank you. Uh, there's a comment here from Caitlin McNulty who says, loved your reading, Dad. Sending love from me and Fred. Ah, thanks, guys. <laughs> love you, too. Uh, Nancy Blakey wanted you to know that this was a beautiful way to start December and end the evening. Thank you, Tim and Salt. Ah. Um, here's one. Thanks to both of you. Always good to replenish the inspiration deficit with words and visions from Bill Yake. Oh, oh Bill. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. Another Bill. fine poet. Um, 
Libby again says, this evening recalls another reading in Port Townsend long, long ago. It's nice to be with you both and, and everyone. Raise a glass to the day we shelter under a tarp in person again. <laughs> um, Pat says, thank you, Tim and Saul, for filling our souls with poetry and memories. And Gina, again, thank you both for a wonderful evening. Um, just two more here. We've got some tough questions here. <laughs> it's a softball audience. <laughs> Um, thank you for your thoughtful and inspiring work. I am grateful for the work being done at North Cascades Institute and for this evening's time out for poetry. And that was from Karen Prince. Thank you, Karen. Uh, here's a question from Christian Martin. Uh, <laughs> I remember raving about Gary Snyder to Tim over lunch long ago as the ultimate bard of the Northwest landscapes. As Tim gently informed me, Snyder has some great poems in his place, but have you ever heard Robert Sund? Thank you for your work, Tim, in preserving and furthering Sun's words and legacy. I guess that was a comment. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Christian. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, thank you everybody for, for your questions and comments. Um, why don't you just chill there um, rather than... Yeah, okay. Um, and folks, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thanks for our in-house audience here. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the support of <laughs> Um, folks at home, I just wanted you to know that we have a couple, uh, we have one more event coming up this year in 2021, and that is with Upper Skagit Elder Scott Schuyler, who will be talking about tribal fish management, um, the traditions of the tribe, and how they have interacted with fish since time immemorial. And that'll actually be next Monday night. So you can check that out on our website and register for that. Um, and you will have a follow-up email to this program with a recording, and that should be in your inboxes very soon. Uh, and also soon we'll have programming for 2022 up on the website uh, available for registration. So please stay tuned for that. And that is all from us tonight. Thank you, everybody, and have a great night. Oh, yes. Thank you, everyone. One yes, and, uh... thank you. And, and here it, whoever said that, here it is to doing this again in person, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, maybe outside at a distance, but in person would be wonderful. And maybe huddled under a tarp or any tarp <laughs> somewhere oh, oh, oh. in uh, Cascadia and the Sailor Sea. Absolutely. Yeah. That was Libby yeah. said that. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> Thanks all. It's a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Let the wild rumpus begin. <laughs> <laughs>